chapter 2. And uh, let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word for the second session of tonight. And we pray that everything that comes forth from this pulpit would honor you, would be encouraging to us as well as challenging and would reveal to a further extent to us your son Jesus Christ and his love for us. And we pray for the same for those who listen by audio or, or watch by audio video. And we ask this in the name of your son Jesus, amen. All right, uh, I'm gonna read something to uh, introduce an area that I'm going to get into by uh, J. Vernon McGee on Jeremiah, uh, because Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, and uh, he wrote Lamentations after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans. And he, of course, prophesied about uh, Jerusalem and Judea being conquered by the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, Jeremiah was quite a, uh, an interesting personality. And uh, here's a few things that are written by J. Vernon McGee about Jeremiah. And I quote, Jeremiah was a remarkable man. I call him God's crybaby, but not in a derogatory sense. He was a man in tears most of the time. God chose this man who had a mother's heart, a trembling voice, and tear-filled eyes to deliver a harsh message of judgment. The message that he gave broke his own heart. Jeremiah was a great man of God. Candidly, I don't think that you and I would have chosen this kind of man to give a harsh message. Instead, we would have selected some hard-boiled person to give a hard-boiled hard message, would we not? God didn't choose that kind of a man. He chose a man with a tender, compassionate heart. And later on, Dr. McGee, Dr. McGee goes on to say, Dr. Moorhead has given to us this very graphic picture of him. And here's a quote from Dr. Moorhead. It was Jeremiah's lot to prophesy at a time when all things in Judah were rushing down to the final and mournful catastrophe when political excitement was at its height, when the worst passions swayed the various parties and the most fatal counsels prevailed. It was his to stand in the way over which his nation was rushing headlong to destruction, to make an heroic effort to arrest it and to turn it back, and to fail and be compelled to step to one side and see his own people, whom he loved with the tenderness of a woman, plunge over the precipice into the wide, weltering ruin. And that's the end of the quote from Dr. Moorhead. So now we're back to Dr. McGee. 
You and I are living at a, at a time which is probably like the time of Jeremiah. By the way, this was uh, fr from his radio transcripts, and uh, this was printed in 1978. So what I'm about to read to you is obviously uh, written before 1978 or by 1978. You and I are living at a time which is probably like the time of Jeremiah. Ours is a great nation today, and we have accomplished many things. We have gone to the moon, and we have atom bombs. Although we are a strong nation, within is the same corruption which will actually carry us down to dismemberment and disaster. It is coming, my friend. Revolution may be just around the corner. I know what I'm saying is not popular today. We don't hear anything like this through the media. Instead, we have panels of experts who discuss how we are going to improve society and how we can work out our problems. Today, God is left out of the picture totally, absolutely left out. If the Bible is mentioned, it is mentioned with a curled lip by some unbeliever. The ones who are believers and have a message from God are pushed aside. I know that. And uh, the word know he has in italics for emphasis. I know that. That is why I say to you that I think we are in very much the same position that Jeremiah was in. For that reason, I know this book is going to have a message for us today. And that was his uh, part of his introduction to the, the book of Jeremiah. Um, I am going to do some teaching tonight from Lamentations, which... Uh, follows Jeremiah in the order of the canon, and uh, also it was the, the other book which Jeremiah wrote. He wrote Jeremiah and he wrote Lamentations, and Lamentations was after the fact of the destruction of Jerusalem and Judea and captivity by the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, I'll just, before we get into the, the main meat of tonight's study, I'll just mention uh, a couple of the more grotesque things that occurred uh, with the fall of this nation and, and typically occur with the fall of nations throughout world history. But in uh, Lamentations 2, verse 20, See, O Lord, and look, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat their offspring, the little ones who were born healthy? Should priest and prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? And so we... Uh, do read of cannibalism during that uh, dis terribly destructive and disrupt uh, disruptive and chaotic time of disaster for uh, God's covenant and client nation. In Lamentations 4, and verse 10, Lamentations 4, verse 10, the hands of compassionate women boiled their own children. They became food for them because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Uh, the, the destruction of the daughter of my people being the, de the destruction of uh, a, a metaphor for the destruction of 
the nation, the covenant nation. And so there was cannibalism. This was one of the uh, many grotesque things that went on at the fall of Jerusalem to the Chaldeans. There was, of course, uh, rape and uh, robbery and uh, all sorts of of, uh, torture and various things. And as far as cannibalism, Josephus, hundreds of years later, described the same thing when uh, Jerusalem fell to Rome in A.D. 70. And uh, during the siege, uh, he wrote of a woman who uh, decided to, rather than have them both starve, uh, she decided to roast her infant son who was still breastfeeding, I believe, and she roasted him and ate half of the body, and other Jews in Jerusalem uh, smelled the smell of the roast and, and came seeking food, and she offered the other half of the child to them, and they were so repulsed that they left. But uh i i mention these things not to be shocking but uh simply to point out that the, the things that happen at the fall of a client nation are uh very horrific and they were for judea and that is why jeremiah this very sensitive compassionate, uh, grief-stricken man wrote Lamentations, which was basically a a series of five funeral dirges for Jerusalem. And so I'm going to start at uh, verse 1, chapter 1 in Lamentations and not go through it all, but Uh, get a little idea of what was happening in the nation and then how Jeremiah was handling the crisis. In Jeremiah 1, verse 1, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow. She who was once great among the nations she who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. She weeps bitterly in the night and tears are on her cheeks. She has none to comfort her. Among all her lovers, all her friends have dealt treacherously with her. And so this is a personification. It is a personification of Jerusalem and the surrounding Judea, but uh, specifically the city of Jerusalem, a city which resided uh, or a city in which resided many doctrine-rejecting believers in Christ and who were completely hostile toward the Word of God which was preached by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, despite his uh, times of sorrow and complaining and believing he was not the man cut out to give the message. He was confident in the message that he was giving, giving, that it was God's message, and it was consistent in that confidence. And this personification, this woman, Jerusalem, 
She wept bitterly in verse 2, and she wept bitterly because there was no capacity for the sudden disaster that befell her. And ironically, that's why the disaster came, because there was no capacity for that disaster, because there was no positive inclination toward the Word of God through God's prophet, Jeremiah. They listened to the, Paul, the, the false prophets who proclaimed all was well, who proclaimed peace, peace, when there was really no peace. But peace, peace, everything will be fine. And we can move on to verse 9. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She did not consider her future. Therefore, she has fallen astonishingly. In other words, suddenly and to her shock at how suddenly and everyone else's shock. She has no comforter. See, O Lord, my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. And why did she not consider her future? because of her disregard for the word of God. And what did she not consider about her future? Number one, what God had promised for disobedience to the word of God by believers in a nation in Leviticus chapter 26. The, the cycles of divine discipline, nor the blessings God had promised for obedience to the word of God. She had no regard for either, for the warning of the cycles of discipline for disobedience or the promises of blessing for obedience. And then number two, her eschatological future, which in the prophetic word up through Jeremiah's time had already been time after time after time after time promised her ultimate glory, national glory, and her uh, obedience to Messiah who would rule over her and how she would be a blessing to the world and a place where the a place from which the Lord would rule the world her promised Messiah would rule the world and how the government would be upon her shoulders. And so Israel is destined for a glorious future. And had that future, had that eschatology, which simply means the, the future, the things to come, had that eschatology been given a place in the thinking of the Jews who disregarded the word of Jeremiah the prophet, they would have had the capacity even for the disaster which befell the city and the nation. Failure to consider that future 
defrauded Jerusalem of self-esteem. And by that I mean self-esteem which is, which is appropriate, self-esteem which is guided by the word of God, spiritual self-esteem. And comfort had been available from God's word and yet was rejected. And for believers in our time, we derive our comfort, yes, from our eschatology. For example, in First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, that event we commonly refer to as the rapture, uh, uh, an event in which we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one, a mystery or an undisclosed truth about this present dispensation until it was disclosed to Paul and he disclosed it to us. But we also derive our comfort from retrospective truth, not looking forward to our eschatology, which is important and which is important for us to look forward to, but our retrospective reality, which is the fact that we roughly 2,000 years, went to the cross with Jesus Christ. And we are crucified with Christ. Don't you know, Paul wrote to the Romans, that so many of us as uh, have been baptized into Christ have been crucified with Christ and therefore so many of us have been as have been crucified have been baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death that just like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father on that basis we should conduct our lives in newness of that resurrection life. And therefore, Romans 6, 11, count ourselves or account ourselves, logizomai, uh, a, an objective accounting word, regard ourselves simply and totally to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. For I am crucified with Christ, as Paul wrote to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now conduct in my, in the flesh or in the sphere of, of my ongoing human life until I'm glorified, I live by the faith of the Son of God, or literally faith from the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we identify with the fact that, that we have died and our life is hid with Christ and God, Colossians 3.3, 3, and therefore set our affections where Christ is and where we are in our position with him sitting at the right hand of God 
in the heavenlies, keeping our focus on the things above. Our, our, and, uh, and developing our value system on the things based on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. We have so much more to go on than, than Jeremiah did, although Jeremiah handled things wonderfully, as we'll see. But when uh, this house of cards collapses, whenever that will be, however that will be, and if, if we're still here, we could uh, die physically before it happens or be raptured before it happens. I'm not a prophet. There are none. But I do know this, that the Lord has put on my heart and I've shared with you that, uh, that every message, could, and it just becomes more and more real to me, every, every teaching session we have together could be the last. And it also, uh, there also could be many more to follow. Or our lives could be interrupted in such a way that the teaching sessions cease out of necessity uh, because of whatever conditions we may be under, human enslavement or whatever might happen. And we have to go on what we've received during these many sessions that we've had together. And I don't, I, I don't know how everything will, will pan out. I'm glad I don't know. Happy I don't know. Uh, but I do know this. I'm excited. I'm not, uh, I'm not a doomsday type of person by any means. Uh, I'm reality-based. Uh, I certainly know things are the way that the Bible has said they're going to be in the world. And they won't get better, they'll get worse. And I know the world doesn't love us because the Bible tells us that. And I know there will be tribulation in the world. These were found and I ate them and they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. So, uh, where am I here? Let's go down to verse 12. Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain which was severely dealt out to me when the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. And this is about Jerusalem's pain. Yep, Jeremiah writes about his pain later, but this is about Jerusalem's pain. Again, Jerusalem personified. And it is a fact that there is no pain like divine discipline. God knows how to push the buttons when he disciplines nations as well as he, when he disciplines individuals. He knows how to push the right buttons. And it's a painful thing, and it's also a gracious thing. In Lamentations 3, here we get into how Jeremiah was handling things. And remember, uh, this is the book Jeremiah wrote following the fall of Jerusalem, 
following a long service of the Word of God, which Jeremiah fulfilled uh, consistently. Jeremiah had his times. I quit God. I can't cut it. And uh, as one person noted, uh, the Lord, in effect, said, okay, I, I'll hold your resignation on my desk because I know you'll be back. And that's what happened. It's, uh, I'm reminded of uh, uh, in Andy Griffith when Barney Fife used to resign. And, and one time he resigned and, of course, came back. He said, what are you going to do with that resignation? And Andy said, just file it with the rest of them. So Jeremiah was going to quit. And uh, so the Lord said in effect to him, okay, I'll hold your resignation on my desk. You'll be back. And Jeremiah came back and he said, the word of the Lord in Jeremiah 20 verse 9 was like fire in my bones. I couldn't hold it in. So he was uh, in an uncomfortable place. He he felt he couldn't cut it, yet he couldn't he couldn't not discharge the word of God, which is uh, uh, you know there are many times in my pastoral career that I have definitely related to that very thing. I've been a baby about uh, I, I can't cut it, going to quit, and yet uh, I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't do it, couldn't quit. And so Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 3, we'll begin with verse 1, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath, he has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. And the the bitterness, notice, encompassed because he was encompassed. He was suffering indeed, but he was surrounded with the bitterness and hardship that was inflicted upon him by others. And... We're going to find out that though things are, he's, he's descriptive and poetically descriptive about uh, his suffering. We're going to find out that this turns out to be suffering for blessing for Jeremiah. Verse 6, in dark places he has made me dwell like those who have long been dead. He has walled me in so that I cannot go out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and call for help, he shuts out my prayer. Now, I find a great connection with that. And with Paul, who in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, had what he described as a thorn in the flesh. And he described whatever that pain was, that painful condition, could have been physical, could have been emotional, could have been both. Whatever painful condition it was, he described as two things. Number one, something that was allowed by God to be administered by a demon operating under Satan's authority. 
but only by divine permission. And number two, twice in the same verse, he described it as being administered to keep Paul from becoming arrogant because of the, the tremendous direct revelations he had received from Christ in the heavenlies so that he could write the, the New Testament epistles he wrote. So if you're receiving personal revelation from Christ in the heavenlies, which you have not received and which I have not received, but the Apostle Paul did receive, uh, it's easy for me to understand how that could be conducive to uh, Paul being tempted to become arrogant. So this was his suffering was to uh, nip that in the bud in the plan of God, and it was suffering for blessing. And had the suffering been removed, he could not have enjoyed the blessing to follow. And if the suffering had been removed for Jeremiah, he could not have enjoyed the blessing which is to follow. And we are to remember that whatever suffering we undergo is momentary light affliction, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that is not worthy to be compared with the glory which will follow. And so in that sense, we can relate to Jeremiah, we can relate to Paul. Jeremiah was given a tough commission. In verse 9, he has blocked my ways with a hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is to me like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in secret places. He has turned aside my ways and torn me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for the arrow. He has made the arrows of his quiver to enter into my inward parts. I have become a laughing stock to all my people, their mocking song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness, actually plural bitternesses, that is the bitternesses inflicted upon him by uh, those who hated him, which was everybody, pretty much. He has made me drunk with wormwood, a, 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 a bitter, poisonous substance. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has made me cower in the dust. In other words, he's ground my face down in the dirt. This is figurative. This is poetic. This is one of those passages which was him being honest, really, with God and, and with everybody about how he felt. It's one of those things I was saying, a, a, a lack of faith. I was sharing with, with Dottie when we were talking about this during the break. One thing I read by McGee that I loved was... was uh, how he said that the people, often the people who are strongest in the faith are, are the people who have great lapses of faith and uh, fall apart and are those who, as uh, this is not exactly how he said it, but those who disbelieve, as in 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. They have those times of, of disbelief. And that often proves the fact that they are strong in the faith because they're willing to reach for God's hand during those times and simply be honest with him and admit, this is how I feel and I'm, I, I am weak in the faith 
and I know there is a solution, but I'm not finding it, and I just want to be honest with you, Lord, take my hand and walk me through this. And the Lord will do that. The Lord wants honesty from us. He wants us to tell him the truth and to tell ourselves the truth. And it's not that he doesn't know the truth anyway. And it's really when we tell ourselves the truth that we're telling him the truth, uh, essentially, because we're telling ourselves things that, that we've been in denial about or have been rationalizing or suppressing in some way. And so in verse 17, my soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say my strength had per has perished and so has my hope from the Lord. And the word for hope in this re English rendering of hope is tocheleth, which means expectation. And what he's really talking about, as, as we'll go on to see, in this case is, was his short-term expectation or his short-term goal. Was it reasonable for him to expect at the beginning of his ministry when the Lord had given him uh, such a harsh, a harsh message for Jerusalem? Was it reasonable to expect that, that some people might respond and be positive toward him? Certainly, that would have been a reasonable expectation. And so he certainly desired that there would be at least somewhat of a turning to God. He came right on the heels of King Josiah, where there was a word of God revival. However, the word of God revival under Josiah turned out to be largely superficial, and we know this because Jeremiah had begun his ministry uh, during the reign of Josiah. And was, was, Jeremiah was in surf service after the, the word of God had been recovered and after there was somewhat of a return to the word of God. But then Jeremiah, it was given to Jeremiah by God to let things fly full steam. And it turned out there was not a positive response in the nation to Jeremiah's preaching. And he suffered greatly because of it. And so his short-term goal perished. But he goes on to say, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Now, let that statement grab you. This I recall to my mind. How, what was he recalling to his mind? The promises of God. And why was he recalling this to his mind? Because verse 20, Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. Humility and being positive toward the word of God, receiving the word of God, remembering the word of God, recalling the word of God. And so... This I recall to my mind, verse 21, 
Therefore I have hope. And in this case, hope is Yah call in the Hebrew to wait with expectation. To wait with expectation. So the short term possibility was gone. But now he was relying on the promises of God and waiting for the long-term goal. He goes on to say, the Lord's loving kindness indeed uh, never, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Quite a different story from what he was just running down. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope. Or I wait with expectation in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he sits silently for the salvation, that is the deliverance of the Lord. So what did he do? He brought his personal eschatology right to the problem. And he saw his own personal eschatology in the eschatology of the covenant people, that God would indeed fulfill his promises to future believers in his covenant program. When would it happen? He didn't know. But he was going to wait. And he waited. And the fulfillment was going to come, uh, the fulfillment was going to, to not come in his own lifetime, but it will in his resurrection. And the covenant promises will be fulfilled to him. And he was, he, he was instructed by the Lord while he was in prison to buy a piece of land that he had the right to buy because it was family land and he had the right to buy this land for his descendants to live on. And it, and it was a piece of, of, of land in Judea that, w that was, uh, when he bought it, occupied by the Chaldeans. So he had a few questions about that with the Lord. But he, he did it, and he did it in faith. He bought that land. And what was that land? That was an investment in the future of the covenant nation, which will have a glorious future. And there's not a doubt in my mind that uh, Jeremiah is going to enjoy that land as well as a lot of other land, but he'll enjoy that piece of property in his resurrection life during the earthly reign of Jesus Christ. But he was, he was then taken to, uh, against his will to Egypt by those who were fleeing to Egypt against the will of God who, who told them to remain in uh, the land under the Chaldeans and to make the best of the situation. And uh, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but tradition has it that he was, he was stoned to death uh, by the people in Egypt. But we don't know that for sure. But uh, a man of substantial faith, 
Yet he had his times, as we all do. And that's why I love the Bible. I love to uh, I look at I love to look at the lives of all these people in the Bible. Uh, every one of them had their own problems of some kind, even the even the spiritual giants. And uh, that just gives me encouragement right there. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the consolation of your word and uh, the excitement that it imparts to us during these times as we look uh, and learn through discipline imparted by your word to continue to look at the things not that are seen, but the things which are unseen, as the things which are seen are temporal and the things which are not seen are eternal. We thank you, Lord, for this segment of teaching. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen.